What's up YouTube? In today's video, we're going to be talking about genetics. Specifically, we're going to be going behind the scenes or under the hood with regards to genetics. So you're not going to learn what genetics is. That in fact, is the prerequisite that you understand completely what genetics are in C-sharp because this video is not going to teach you that. But unless you understand what genetics already are, this video may not even make sense to you. So let's get started. Because the C-sharp team knew they wanted to introduce genetics. They also knew they didn't have the time to introduce genetics in version 1, 1 1.1. And so it was slated for version 2. One of the things that they had to do to support genetics was they had to modify the, the runtime, the CLR, and to support genetics. So the genetics support is implemented in the, in the runtime, which since that time, they've actually refrained from doing quite a bit. There was a the way they understood the runtime was it was part of the operating system in that sense. They wanted to make it seem like it's part of the operating system so you didn't have to go and install .NET on each version of your operating system, which they now regret and they've changed their ideas a little bit since .NET Core. They've now said that they can run side by side and all this sort of thing. But at the time, changing the runtime was not a good idea. At least that's how they thought in those days. And so for Genix, they did have to modify the runtime. Now they took the help of Microsoft Research in Cambridge, and specifically a person by the name of Tom Syme, who's a research scientist, I guess. I'm not sure. He's from Microsoft Research, and they go about researching all kinds of things about programming. Tom Syme is also the sort of the creator, Mr. F Sharp, as he's known as today, and apparently a very smart, intelligent person. Al him, along with the CLR team and Anders Halsberg and the C Sharp team, came up with the sort of the two pronged approach to Ginex implementation, the runtime version, and then of course the language feature in the language version of it, because the compiler, the C sharp compiler, does have to compile and produce enough metadata at compile time so that the runtime, the JIT compiler, can then take that and do something with it. So they had to introduce they had to introduce new opcodes as well in the in the IL to support genetics, and so it was a two pronged approach, if you will. And since then, they've actually not modified the runtime to support language features. Now they certainly modified and enhanced the runtime to improve performance and better garbage collection, less pressure on the GC and all kinds of things like that, but not to support a language feature. So that's, now actually in C Sharp 8, <laughs> in C Sharp 8 they modified the runtime again, the, the CLR, again to support one of the most useless features I've ever seen, and that is default interface implementations or default implementation methods or whatever they call that feature where interfaces can now ha have implementation. Like, why would they do that? Anyway, to introduce that feature, believe it or not, they had to modify at the runtime. So they, once again, after so many years and so many versions of C Sharp, they finally modified the runtime only to give us default interface implementations. So that's some background on genetics and, and the implementation behind the scenes. Now let's talk about what happens when you compile and run applications in which you use genetics. Now typically we use genetics for collections, so I'm just going to stick to that for this example here. And you can translate that, or you can extend, extend that, extrapolate that for other scenarios, other things as well. So let's say in your application you're using a list of int and a list of date time, so let's say value types, right? So prior to genetics, these value types had to be boxed to put them into this array list, which was a, a list of object. And of course, since you're putting things in as an object, it has to be the value type has to be boxed. And when you want it, when you take it back out, you have to unbox it to get back the value type that you put in. Let's say if you put an int in there, you want an int coming back out, not an object. So the boxing and unboxing had to be done, and as a result of which, it was you know costing you in terms of memory allocations, in terms of garbage collection, the pressure on the garbage collector and so on and so forth. So there was a performance problem there with prior to genetics. Java genetics, they are slightly different from C sharp genetics in that Java genetics are implemented using type erasure, which is erasing of types or type information. That is, by the time the Java compiler finishes compiling your code, the type parameters of the generic types have been erased and you've gone all left with an object. So effectively in Java, it's a little more involved than that, but effectively in Java you have 
It's like the array list, list we have in C sharp. By the time you get compiled down, you got a collection of object. You don't know the actual type. So type erasure implies that at, when you reflect on your thing at runtime, you have no idea about the actual type. Right? So the type erasure is really saying that the types have been erased from any information at runtime. So you cannot reflect over it and determine the, the type. C sharp generics, on the other hand, is implemented using rarefied types. This essentially means the type information is fully baked into the metadata and is available to you at runtime or during reflection. So when you look at your list of int, you can see it's a list of int, it's not a list of object, right? And so generics in C Sharp are implemented very much like a class or a type, like any other type. They're not any different or special. If you were to contrast that with C++ templates, then C++ templates are more like a macro or a macro on steroids. Stuff happens at compile time, so it produces all the class definitions, if you will, at compile time. C Sharp doesn't do that at compile time, it does that at JIT compile time, so just in time and at runtime. So here's how it works, the basic implementation, conceptually. <laughs> Your list of int, if you've never touched that at runtime before, then of course the JIT compiler has to compile this thing, and it's going to say, okay, well, I don't have a list, list of int as yet. So what it does is it produces the code as a class definition for your list of int. And then it creates an instance of that. That list of int implementation is a very specialized implementation for list of ints. And so there's no boxing and unboxing occurring and there's no casting required. And so you get the performance that you get that you don't normally get with the array of list, if you will, you know, prior to generics. So with C sharp generics for at least for value types, you actually end up getting some performance benefits because the there's a specialized type for every value type you have in your code, every value type that you touch, right? So maybe you've got lists of, you know, 10,000 different things, value types. If you only use four of them, then the type definition will be produced for the four that you've touched, not the whole set, right? So it's just, just in time, so it's JIT compiled. And these types that are being produced for value types are specialized for each type, generic type parameter that you might have in your generic class. So a list of int will be different from a list of date time, will be different from a list of long, will be different from some struct you might have and so on. So that's gonna add some sort of code bloat or the working set of your application at runtime is gonna increase or will be larger than you would have thought because the, these things are being created at runtime, right? So there's a sort of a drawback in some sense that will say that you know, the, the working set of your application starts to grow. Now it could be grown to a large amount that may not be acceptable to you, but nonetheless, you have to understand that it's gonna grow, right? Now for reference types, the story is slightly different. The jitter will produce one class definition, if you will, for a reference type. The reason is that value types, the sizes of these structures, if you will, are different, and so it, the memory footprint of those things is different, so it has to produce one for each one, and plus you don't want the boxing and unboxing penalty and so you have to make them specialized for each type. Whereas for reference types, it's just a pointer to start with, and they can cast it to whatever the type is. So there's only, the code produces just for the one type, and that's shared across all reference types. So there's no, there's not a huge amount of code load in that case for reference types. But for value types, there's one, let's say a class definition being produced for each value type that you're having, that you use in your, in your application. All right, so, we contrasted some, some, to some extent, the difference between C Sharp generics and Java generics and C++ templates at a high level. And I've given you some understanding of what goes on behind the scenes under the hood, as well as some background or backstory to the genesis of generics in the C Sharp language. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you've learned some things. If you have, please give me a thumbs up and I will see you next time.